Hey, welcome, welcome everybody. Good way, third year. Got a couple of announcements before we get started here. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. I was all we had, we, this is our annual Women's Month. We have all women speakers all month long for the month of September. It's five of them. Uh, everyone is just as good or better than the next one. And, and that's how we do that in the second one. September is a pretty eventful thing for us. We had a, a workshop uh, scheduled, uh, I think it was for this week or something like that. It, the, Logistics didn't work out. It's got postponed, so I don't know. So the important way to follow our group, we have a, a Facebook page, the Conscious Contact Speaking Group of Doylestown, and updates can get posted in there. We also have a website. So you get to see speakers that are booked nine months a year, year and a half ahead, the workshops that are booked ahead. It's really simple to find. You go on Google, you, you, you Google Saturday Night AA uh, Doylestown one-hour speaker meeting, and it'll come up and you'll see makes it very simple. Um, the other announcement is that we have a caution tape on that side of the church. Nobody absolutely for no reason is allowed on that side. The church doesn't want us on that side. It's a very simple request. The bathroom is at the back of the room, all the way to the left. And they ask that we do not smoke on church property. Okay, they, they have a $10 million facility. They give the key to a bunch of alcoholics and us. And all we got to do is not smoke on it, and maybe to let us stay here. It's pretty, it's a pretty good deal for a guy like me. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I love this meeting. I love you guys, and love AA. So it's important that we all work together, and try to keep the bathrooms clean. And if you, if you need a, uh, if you'd like to get involved with this group, we always, we, we usually hear about 7:15 every, every Saturday night, and we set up, and there's a big setup, and there's also a big breakdown. So if you're looking for service, for see us after the meeting. There's always a ton of work with this. is a big meeting, and. Um, with that, I'm going to give you, Lily's going to come up here and enjoy the night. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lily, and I'm an alcoholic. So, welcome everybody to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a one-hour speaker meeting that meets here every Saturday evening at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, and it's at 301 North Main Street here at 8.30 p.m. in Doylestown. The purpose of the group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance and service to others through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, just simply ask. So this is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and the group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce him or herself with their first name only? Please raise your hand. Yes. Hey, John, welcome. Hi, Sunny, welcome. Yes, sir. Hi, Rick, welcome. Yes. Hey, Cheryl, welcome. Yes. Hey, Jack, welcome. Hey, Matt. Hey, Chip, welcome. Anybody else? Okay, all right. So the Conscious Contact Speaker Group also encourages sponsorship. Is there anyone with working knowledge of the 12 steps and willing to sponsor, please raise your hand. Great, so if you don't have a sponsor, please hook up with one of these folks after the meeting. Um, does anyone have any announcements for the good of AA? No, yes, no, okay. So we have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you can't afford a big book, uh, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one free of charge. Anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big books and CDs to help those who can't afford them, please put your donations back on that buffet table in that jar. Um, it's marked big book and CD donations. If you'd like a CD of any speaker in the past or present, please see Ron after the meeting. There's a wide assortment of them, and they're available free of charge and great to listen to. And I have asked Carol to come up and read the AA preamble. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Carol. I'm an alcoholic. The AA preamble. 
Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sex, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. I have asked Jen to come up and read the AA 12 Steps of Recovery. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> the 12 steps of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought to repair meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Uh, we do have a seventh tradition. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. And at this time, we'd like to pass the baskets. Um, we do not have any dues or fees, but we do have expenses for the coffee, all of the food that you see here, big books and CDs, and the rent, of course. As Ron mentioned before, there's absolutely no smoking on church property, please, and this would probably be a good time to stop, silence all cell phones and try to limit movement during the meeting to uh, avoid distractions. And now, um, it's my pleasure, it's our pleasure to introduce our speaker. She's a very good friend of the Conscious Contact Speaker Group, is, and she's on loan to us from the Greenwood Group of, of Brooklyn, New York. Please welcome John C. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dawn Gallagher, and I am an alcoholic. And, um, oh, wow. I, first, I just want to give uh, praise and thanks to the God of my understanding, um, by which I would not be standing here today um, if he didn't show me his grace and mercy. And I wouldn't have gotten to my God of my understanding without Alcoholics Anonymous. So I want to give a shout out for Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to give a shout out um, to great sponsorship. Um, I want to give a shout out to this big book, The 12 Steps, The 12 Traditions, The Concepts. And I want to give a shout out to Ron Kay, because this is set up like some kind of presidential thing, you know? <laughs> like no pressure, you know? So, <laughs> no pressure here. Um, so yeah, my name's Dawn, and uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, yay! They used to say one out of every seven people can trace their roots back to Brooklyn, and um, that's our claim to fame. You know, uh, that and you swim with the fishes, but um, my home group is the Greenwood Group, uh, has two meetings a day. Um, I have a sponsor, her name is Karina C. I actually use her, I call her, we have a relationship, which is very important. She knows that she's my sponsor. Um, I sponsor a lot of women uh, through this big book, through these 12 steps, you know, and... Um, 
yeah, for the most part, I'm happy, joyous, and free, but there are those moments, you know, um, and that's why I'm so grateful that, you know, I am recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body, um, that I don't need to drink today for any reason, um, but that was not always the case. Um, my claim to fame is, uh, my nickname back home used to be One Day Back Dawn. And I don't say that like, wow, it, it was, I was one of those, those, those girls that they never thought would get it. After I thought I had it. Because I, I was, I was sober for seven years before, you know, a glass of champagne sent me out. And, um, and then I, I suffered. I suffered in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for nine years. Not wanting to drink, but drinking anyway, not knowing what was wrong with me, what was wrong with me. And I am so grateful that there are people like Ron and people in this room that know the directions and know the program of recovery, which is in the book, you know, and know the three sides of the triangle and what it takes to battle this very, very deadly, insidious, dangerous disease. Um, because if not, I don't think any of us would be here right now sitting in this room, you know? Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background. I came from a really great family. I am Irish, Spanish, and Sicilian. This is a recipe for trouble. <laughs> you mix that with alcohol, and it's double trouble. And it's just the way it was, you know? Um, I grew up in a brownstone, you know? And I don't know, there's not a lot of people that live like this anymore. I actually lived in a brownstone with my entire family. I mean, I had my grandma and grandpa on the first floor, my aunt and uncle, my cousins on the second floor, you know, my mom, dad, I'm one of four, I'm the second, two boys, two girls, we had dogs, um, Brooklyn was that kind of place where everybody knew your business, even if you didn't want them to know your business, they did, but it was a very family-oriented kind of place. Um, Y'all went to Catholic school, because I did, and I did for 12 years, can't you tell, you know? <laughs> Like, that's where, that was the, the lifestyle of Brooklyn, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. And, um, but I can say that it's far and long before I ever picked up a drink, and it's only looking back that I can say this. I was not comfortable in my own skin. I did not want to be from Brooklyn. I didn't like how I felt, and I definitely did not want a Brooklyn accent. And, you know, that was my experience. I always wanted to be someplace else doing something else with someone else. My whole life. You know? Um, great family, though. Lots of love. A little alcoholism mixed in there, too. You know? It's, I am Irish. <laughs> it's in there. And, um, you know, from a very young age, you know, I learned, um, you know, that, that drinking wasn't the way to go. And, um, you know, I, I really didn't start drinking until I was about 14 or 15. I was in high school. I went to an all-girl Catholic high school. That alone should be a reason to drink, you know, with nuns. There were no men in, no men in that building. And, uh, you know, it started out harmlessly, but I can remember, you know, going to the promenade. There's the Twin Towers. I'm with my home girls. I got a beatbox, right? I got the blue eyes shadow on. And we're cracking open Heineken's with our teeth. Why? Oh, I don't know. That's what we did. And um, I can honestly say I love the effect produced by alcohol, you know. Um, and it was usually a couple and some other substances. But, you know, when I got home, mind you, I had to get to, get to the third floor. That's like, you know, get past my grandmother and grandfather, get past my aunt and uncle. I mean, it wasn't an easy thing. And I do say that because of the way I was raised, my drinking did not take off as, as quickly as it should have or could have. And um, so I fixed that. By the time I'm 17, I'm in college, you know, and I'm away. And I'm away. And that's where I discovered, you know, sex, booze, and rock and roll. You know, I was dawn from Brooklyn. I mean, what did I know of anything? Um, ironically enough, I was a good student. I was a 3.95 student studying political science. You know, I wanted to get into politics. And, you know, they, I don't know if any of you are in the room that can remember the drinking age changing. So I'm 18, and I'm, you're allowed to drink, and you're in New York, and... 
So they moved the drinking age to 19. I, I lose my privileges for six months, you know, and I'm out in Long Island in school, and I really, I lost my privileges for six months. Then I turned 19, and I was drinking again, and then they moved it to 21 with no grandfather clause, and it was like, I got so fed up, I, I went down to D.C. to go to college. And so for the next two years in college, I majored in drinking, because the drinking age down there was 18 and it was legal and I was far enough away from my family and I was doing what I wanted to do um, I have no regrets uh, about the way I drank and, and you know a lot of crazy things happened um, but I didn't know that I was suffering you know from this restless irritable discontent and miserable feeling that only alcohol would conquer I didn't know that um, and I'm going to speed it up. So over the next six years, I bartended. I was in college for 10 years. I never learned to drive a car. Um, I picked up uh, some very unattractive and very um, not good men along the way. You know, I could pick them. Um, did go to class, blackouts, lots of blackouts. You know, it was an everyday occurrence. I had to move back to New York. I bartended, and I'm the kind of chick that had a loaded gun behind her bar, two bats, and I would use them. By this time, I'm drinking a bottle of scotch a day, you know, and I, it was very hard to keep a, a bartending job. It was just hard. You can't be in a blackout and passed out and bartend. It just doesn't go together, and so um, I moved home. You know, I had my own place, um, but where does a girl who can't finish college who's in debt, who doesn't know how to drive a car, who can't even provide for herself, where do we go? And I went home. I went home to my mom's house. And, um, and she opened up her door, you know? That's what moms do. Moms let us back. You know, but what, what I did to my mom, you know, and I'm so great I have a, a good relationship with her. Within two months, she's like, you know, Dawn Marie, and that's what you get called. <laughs> you know what, Dawn Marie? You either stop your drinking and you get the hell out of my house. And she was serious because she had asked my father to leave about eight or nine years prior to that. She knew what drinking was about. And um, so I got scared, you know, fear. Fear is a great motivator to change. I'm like, I'll go to rehab, Mom. I'll go to rehab. And I did. And I went there for 32 days. And I learned a lot of great things in, in rehab. First of all, it was probably the first time I was clean or off of any kind of substance Maybe in about 12 years, you know, um, so I felt a little bit better. Um, they told me that I should go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I said, okay, I'll do that when I get out, and I did, and I got back to Brooklyn, and, you know, that's what I did. I went to AA. I went to AA every day. I didn't drink, and I went to AA. I put the plug in the jug, I didn't drink, and I went to AA. I went to AA every day, and I didn't drink, you know? And I think that because I was 26 years old, I was able to do that, that in fear, because I was still living home with my mom, you know? And after I didn't drink for a while, I started to think, my God, I, I, I've been missing the last 12 years of my life. Let me graduate college. Let, let, me, let me learn to drive. Let me get out of debt. I call it the lock-on target syndrome because that's what I did for the next seven years. I locked on targets and I would climb over your head to get to that target. What kind of targets? Well, I learned to drive, I want a car, I took my sister's car. She wanted it back, I said, no, nah. you know, that's locked on target. Now, was I selfish and self-centered? Probably. Did I care? No, not really, you know? Um, and that's the thing. I found out, looking back now, I probably caused more damage in the seven years I did not drink than when I was actually inebriated and passed out. Because you can't cause much trouble when you pass that on the floor, you know? It's the kind of drinker I am. And um, so over the next seven years, it was just, what do I want? I want, I want. And I was going to the meetings, you know, and I was 13 stepping over here, and I was like, you know, I was alive. And I decided, you know what, let me get a job. I'm gonna get a job. I'm gonna get into the hotel industry. Lock on target, you know what I'm saying? And I would get it. It's like, I wasn't waking up sick anymore. I wasn't vomiting into garbage cans. You know, my, my bartender didn't have to carry me, you know, get, get a bouncer to carry me home. I was awake. And, and what I found out is that it worked for me not drinking. 
his things. I started accumulating a lot of things. By the time I was four and a half years sober, now mind you, never went through these steps. Who even knew there were steps? Look, yes, I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm Irish and I can't hold my liquor. I get it. And my life is unmanageable because I drank. So I thought. And then I jumped out at 12, having had a spiritual awakening, because I thought I felt good. I had no idea that I was a human doing. And then I was collecting things. I talk about it. I have a, one of the girls, thank you, Barry, for coming with me today. I collect things when I'm in dry time. What does that mean? I need your validation. So what do I have? I have this china closet inside, and I collect things. I collect men, jobs, titles, promotions, money, your husband, you know, your wallet, whatever I want. This is, this is what I thought sobriety was, you know? And, and, and then I would have to, like, work harder. Why? Because I cannot outrun that insanity of the mind. But see, no one's explained anything to me. So I don't even know that I have it. So picture this. I moved to Puerto Rico. God is good, right? I get the condo. I, I married a Belgium tennis professional, right? Why? Because it looks good in my resume and in my china closet, right? Because I need these outside little bursts of energy to keep me sane and sober. So I thought, right? So we're at a wedding, you know, and, you know, here it is. And they talk about it in the big book. Not a cloud in the sky. I'm in Puerto Rico, right? We're at a wedding. And they're passing around the champagne. And, I, and by this time, I'm two months shy of seven years. I'm kind of going to AA down there. I, I, I haven't been through the process. I didn't have a spiritual awakening. You know, I was a ticking time bomb, and I didn't know it. And, and even to this day, I'm the last person to know that there's something wrong with me. <laughs> Isn't that funny? We're like the last person to know until it's too late. So I'm there, and they're passing around, very festive day, right? And I said, no, I can't have you. He goes, you must have the champagne. I said, I can't. It's alcohol. He goes, this is not alcohol. This is champagne, right? <laughs> In French accent, it sounds a hell of a lot harmless, right? <laughs> Doesn't even sound like it'll be an issue. Because I'm a scotch drinker. Delusion of the mind. One glass of champagne. Then a bottle, two bottles, mix cocktails, mix in other substances, 36 hour run. What does my delusional mind say? I can come back tomorrow. And I would come back tomorrow for the next nine years. You know, and I still don't know what's wrong with me. You know, so I get bored, you know, all of a sudden Puerto Rico gets very dark, you know, very dark and gray. I'm driving drunk now. You know, I'm not showing up to work. I, I have the flu. I'm in Puerto Rico. I have the flu. You know, I'm calling out two and three times sick a month. And so what do I do? I'll fix things. See, that's what I do. I'm a fixer. I don't let God fix anything. I haven't even had an experience with God, you know. God's out there. And so I divorce the Belgium guy, hook up with the Dutch guy, and next thing I know, it's bone in Amsterdam. <laughs> so I move to Amsterdam because I'm about the adventure, right? I need that high. Now maybe I'll get sober in it because I got the guy, right? <laughs> yes, I'm a bartender. I mix things, you know. I think I, I can figure things out. So I go to Amsterdam. That didn't work go well, you know. <laughs> I found out it's scientifically impossible to ride a bike drunk. <laughs> you think you can, you cannot. Because <laughs> I couldn't, you know. Did the Heineken factory, what's the problem? It's, he's the problem. The Dutch people are the problem. This is the problem. And I was going to AA. They have English-speaking AA meetings there. And I heard people talk about the steps that God... Maybe my head was too loud. Maybe I didn't understand stuff. I don't know. But I did reach a place of, I got to get home. I got to get back to Brooklyn. Because if I get back to Brooklyn and I sit in the same seat, in the same meeting, I get the same sponsor, I'm going to be struck sober again. Because I'm not having fun. No one wants to be around me. I drink to blackout. You know? And then it takes me two and three days to recover. Nobody wants to be with me. And I don't want to do it. And I don't know how to stop. So I come back to New York, 2002. You think I would just, you know? And I did that. And I'd count. 
I get 10 months, I go out. I get 6 months, I go out. I get 7 months, I go out. I make 90 meetings in 90 days, and I go out drinking right after I got my 90-day point. And, 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 and as this is happening, the people in the rooms are like, Stay away from the to I'm in an AA meeting. Isn't that what I'm supposed to be doing? I'm trying. I'm white knuckling it. Thank God I don't do this anymore, you know? And um, so there's this girl I sponsored back in the 90s. Of course, I never went through the steps, so I should be able to sponsor. <laughs> Crazy from Brooklyn, but. Her name was Elda, and uh, she hadn't had a drink for 12 years. Um, and she did a lot of things. She was a single mom. She raised her kids on her own. She finished college. She went on to be a school teacher. I'm friends with her t- to this day, you know. We just saw each other a couple of days ago. She celebrated 22 years of sobriety. And, um, and 11 years ago, I saw her, because I didn't stop coming to the meetings. Yeah, you, you guys are calling me one day back at dawn, but I'm going to get this if it kills me, and it's going to kill me. And I walk into the meeting. Now, here's the thing about Elda. She was miserable. I mean, you can't even put a word to it. You say, hey, Elda, how's it going? You'd hear, <laughs> really, that bad? <laughs> she, or she would just be like, <laughs> she wouldn't say anything. And one day I walk into the meeting and I'll never forget it. She looked different. She looked so different and so put together and so different. There's no other word that I could describe it. And I had known her for 12 years. I had sponsored her or, you know, not sponsored her back in the 90s. And uh, I said, you know, what are you doing? You know, you look fabulous. Did you get a new boyfriend? (laughs) No. You got a job promotion, right? Outside stuff, outside stuff is gonna fit, fix an inner condition. And then I said to her, you hit the lotto. And she goes, no. And then she said the damnedest thing, that someone from Staten Island had taken her through the 12 steps and she found God. And I'm thinking, holy crap. And I back up. Because I don't understand anything. But it planted a seed. And over the next six months, her look didn't change. She looked peaceful and calm and joyful. You know, and I loved her. And, and she invited me to her birthday party. January 11th. Oh, by the way, my sobriety date is January 14th, 2007. Um, and on January 13th, 2007, she invited me to her birthday party. And I, I did it. I was going, you know. I'm bored, right? I'm not drinking. I'm white-knuckling it. I probably had a couple of a weeks at this time, you know. And uh, I got dressed. And I do it, you know. <laughs> I know I'm an alcoholic. I got to get the biggest and best gift, right, so that you like me. And I'm, I'm dressed up, and I'm on my way to the art train. And suddenly the tractor beam at O'Keefe pulls me in sideways and I'm ordering a drink. The insanity of ordering a drink. And for me, it's never a drink. And I don't remember getting home that night. And by this time, my doormen were quite accustomed to carrying my drunk, lifeless body up to my apartment and lying me down on my sofa. You know? And I was, I was, I was, you know, still in, in a hotel manager, you know, by a thread. Um, I kept a lot of secrets. My family had no idea that I was this sick. And uh, the next morning, I wake up and I'm covered in blood. And I don't understand. And I thought I had gotten stabbed because I, I have a little bit of a fresh mouth, you know, back then. And uh, I go to the mirror and I see it's, it's caked on dry blood. And now I'm vomiting blood. I'm about 20 pounds thinner than I am now. My eyes are dark, you know. My face is just sunken in. It's just, it's not pretty. It's just not pretty. And now I'm covered in blood. And I do what I always do. I clean the mess up. Right? I can't let anyone know that I'm living this way. You know, there's got to be a solution, and so I'll just clean it up and pretend. I'll just say I have one day back. That's what I'll do, because that works, you know? 
until it doesn't anymore. And I'm so tired. I'm tired. How do you stop it? And that's when God entered my life. And he had never left. He didn't leave. But he made his presence known because the phone rang. And when I'm in that condition, I let it go to voicemail. I'm not picking up a phone. I can't talk to anybody. What am I going to say? But I pick it up and it's Zelda. And she asked me two questions. She said, are you okay? And I said, I think I'm dying. And then she said, can I help you? And I said, please, make it stop. Make it stop. And she didn't waste any time, you know. I, you know, detoxing yourself, not a good thing. I don't recommend it. Alcohol, it can kill you, you know. And that's what I did. I detoxed in my house. I was so sick, you know. Drinking a bottle of scotch. <laughs> no wonder why I was throwing up blood, but she came over, she nursed me back to health, she got a big book, you know, she bought over a new big book, and she goes, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you, you know, are you willing, are you willing to go to any length for victory over alcohol? <gasps> yes. Have you surrendered to your innermost self that you're alcoholic? Yes. Do you suffer from a restless you know, a, a restless, are you restless, irritable, and discontent? I'm like, I don't feel good. You know, am I suffering from a sickness that I can't even stop? And so she started, she got the book, and you know what she asked me? She asked me that first time, and I'll never forget it. She said, do you know what your problem is? And I'm like, you know, and when you get better a couple of days, and you, the ego comes back, it just does, you know? I don't like to being told, and I don't like people to know that I don't know. I don't like, to this day, I don't like that you don't, I don't know, <laughs> you know? And she said, do you know what you're suffering from? Do you know what your problem is? And I said, yeah, I drink too much. And she said, that is not your problem. I'm like, really? What is my problem? She goes, you're selfish and you're self-centered. And I said, that's impossible. I'm in hospitality. <laughs> I really thought, right? I really thought because I was in hotel management that I was nice and kind and sweet and thoughtful and, hi, how can I help you? That big smile, you know? And she said, you've never done anything for anybody else without having expectations of getting something in return. Either that's a pat on the back, you know, outside validation, or my favorite, you low me. She knocked the wind right out of me. You'll owe me. You know? And then she took this book, and this is the same book, you know? <laughs> it's kind of shredded now, but, you know, I didn't even know what the, the three sides of the triangle. I had no idea, you know? And we went page by page. We started with the preface, but the most amazing thing, and before we even started, that I, uh, she said, you know... <laughs> Can you lay aside everything you think you know about Alcoholics Anonymous? Again, attacking the ego. Because I had been in AA since 1991. I mean, some of, some of the information I had might have been useful, right? <laughs> she goes, look at your track record. You know? Yeah, I'm sagging, people. I'm sagging. <laughs> you got a little broad. You know? And uh, she said, can you lay aside everything you think you know? Can you pretend like you never came to Alcoholics Anonymous? Can you pretend you know nothing about the big book or the steps? Can you just, for a split second, just pretend you know nothing so that you can have an open mind and a new experience with what we are about to do? And for some reason I could do that because it made sense, you know? And in fact, before I came up here, I sat there and I did my lay aside, my set aside prayer. I don't know what I say when I come up here. My number one priority is, is to trust my God, clean house, and help other people. And maybe if I could help one person that's relapsing and going through the same misery and pain that I went through since 1991, I mean, then I did my job. And the one thing I couldn't... 
I was in a little bit of disbelief, but she still looked good, you know? She was recovered. She had had a spiritual experience as a result of going through this work. Right then and there, on my knees, I said to her, to, to God, if this information and what I'm about to do really, really worked, like if this 12-step program and the three sides of the triangle and maybe I don't know everything that I think I know, if all this stuff really, really works when I actually take action, I will not shut up about it. And that's my claim to fame. I don't shut up about it, you know? And back when I got sober, the big book wasn't that popular in Brooklyn, you know? But that's okay, because it really works, you know? And we went page by page. You know, how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism? You know, and that's the main purpose of this book. And that the basic text has not been changed in all these years. And that what I'm suffering from is a hopeless state of mind and body. My mind will always try to kill me. My mind will tell me it's okay to have one glass of champagne. And we know how that experiment went. But I will be unable to recall with sufficient force the suffering and humiliation and degradation of a day, a week, or a month ago. I am without mental defense against the first drink, you know, and this is all the stuff. Over the next couple of months, we went page by page. We went into the doctor's opinion. I don't know if you've ever read the doctor's opinion, but according to some doctors, us alcoholics, not only are we in a class and an entity all to ourselves, we're doomed, you know? <laughs> Sounds great, you know? And then he even said that we needed moral psychology. We needed something to shift inside, not outside. And that made sense to me, because nothing I had ever done on the outside, from the minute I got sober in 1991 to the time I picked up in 1997, fixed me. Nothing fixed me. I can't fix me. We went through the steps, that powerless, mental obsession, right? I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it, I don't. My deepest desire not to drink, not good enough, to keep me sober. Not even today, not good enough. Unmanageability? My life's unmanageable when I'm not drinking. That's why I need this program of recovery. And I didn't know how unmanageable my life was until I actually went through the work. You know, and then we went through Bill's story, you know? And I, I, turning statements into questions. I didn't understand that, you know? That year that I got sober, a lot of things were happening in my life just besides me showing up to our house once a week and then twice a week we'd go to Staten Island for solution-based meetings. Uh, we went to Common Solution. People used to call it Common Delusion. That place saved my life, you know? There were people talking the language of love. They were talking about God. They weren't afraid to say God, you know? My father was dying of cancer, and my grandmother was 95 years old. And I knew that at the end of the year, even though I might celebrate one year, my life was going to look very different, and I did not want to drink. So whatever she told me to do, I did. We started with the, with the one-minute meditation. And of course, me with my arrogance, one minute? Well, why don't you do five or ten, you know? Try shutting down a chattering mind for one minute. I could shut it down for 20 minutes. But in the beginning, it was like just following directions, you know? And praying. She had me say prayers right off the bat. I didn't even know that there was a third step prayer in there. By the time I'm two months sober, we're on our knees, you know? We're in how, we're in how it works, you know? She's explaining things to me. We're on our knees. And then we launched into this, you know... Fearless and searching moral inventory, you know, and I was ready, you know, because she said, you're the problem. And I said, I understand that. And we did it. The resentment list, I loved it. I put people down there 20, 30 years ago. Nuns were down there. The IRS was down there. Ex-boyfriends, the Dutch guy, the Belgian guy. <laughs> and they were on the sex conduct inventory, too. You know, fear of being alone. I had to do those inventories. Harms. She gave me a timetable. She didn't just say, okay, do your fourth step and then that's it. You know, we went through a timetable. And then the best was when we got to that fourth column and then everything just, you know, where am I selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, and afraid? 
you know? And then the fear, afraid of being alone, afraid of not being good enough, you know? Afraid of dying, afraid of being sick. I'm supposed to be building this relationship with this God of my understanding, and I'm fearful. And that's okay, you know? Today, when I'm fearful, just sitting quiet. Just sitting quiet and connecting to the power. Lack of power is my problem. If I could have fixed me, I would have done it back in 1991. I don't have that power. And all this stuff, these character defects, they're on top of my God light, you know? I found out it is scientifically impossible to be nasty, condescending, dishonest, unforgiving, belligerent, backstabbing, thoughtless, victim, self-pitying, and say, wow, it's going to be a great day, right? It doesn't, it doesn't go together. I, I knew nothing. You know, I knew nothing. Please, God, show me truth. Please, God, show me truth. I'll never forget it. So, we, 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 I had done the fourth step and um, we get to the fifth step. I'm five months sober now. She writes the list of character defects. Selfish, self-seeking, dishonest. I named some of them. I mean, it's a lifestyle being out there, you know. <laughs> there are principles that I lived my life out there, drinking or not drinking and dry without God. I call them non-God principles. So I found out that I'm backstabbing, belligerent, nasty, condescending, rude, dismissive. One of my favorites. Shoo shoo, you know. <laughs> Fearful. She gives me this list. And I look at it. And you know, in the fifth step it says, you know, we can look the the, the, the world in the eye. You know? I didn't feel good. Here were a list of character defects, you know? Behaviors that I had practiced for the last 40, 35 years, you know? I hope I was good when I was a little kid, but, you know, and, um... She told me, you know, that's not who you are, that's what you practice. That's not who you are, that's what you practice. And the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous and God and working with a sponsor and the fellowship, you can practice something different. You can learn to be kind and patient and loving and tolerant and forgiving. Doesn't that just make your hair stand up, you know? I was like, ew, how distasteful, you know? (laughs) Could you imagine? And I realized that I could not keep the job that I had and started to, with God's power and grace, to practice the opposite and do the six and seven, you know? My creator, and now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I knew I could not work 12 and 13 hours a day and then skip around town and be kind and patient and loving and forgiving. It just didn't... So I walked in and I quit my job. I quit, I quit a 20 year career, you know, because it says, am I willing to go to any length? And I knew damn well that if I didn't finish up these steps, make amends to these people, get in contact with the God, daily, daily reprieve, get in contact with the God of my understanding, I wasn't going to survive the blows that were coming ahead. And they were coming. You know, and that's the amazing thing about life. It's not, if. Life's going to deal us something that's going to knock us to our knees. It's just a matter of when, you know. And I was, I was a little afraid, you know. But I, I started to see the change in my behaviors and my attitudes, you know. And then I started doing my amends. And it was quickly, by the time I'm seven months, I'm almost done with all my amends. But meanwhile, I'm actually practicing a different lifestyle. I'm picking up my dad, I'm taking him to the beach, we're laughing, we're talking. I'm not, I'm living in the moment. I'm not wasting any time. I'm trying not to be selfish and self-centered and self-absorbed. But I'm scared, and I need God, and I need you people. You know, I had a bunch, uh, a bunch, four or five people in the fellowship that surrounded me. Paulie D, Karina, Elda. I needed these people. I was so afraid, you know? But I didn't want to drink, and I didn't want to be drunk at my father's funeral. I did not. 
And I kept going. I'm making the amends. And some people were like, well, some guys tell me, don't you ever contact me again. You know, there were a couple of those. But for the most part, most of my amends were like, we're glad you're okay. We knew you were sick. Like I said, I'm always the last person to know that there's something wrong with me. But people knew that I worked for that I was sick. And that I wasn't doing well. 10, 11, and 12. Love 10, 11, and 12. Live in 10, 11, and 12, you know? Since we've entered the world of the spirit, continue to, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And when these crop up, we go to God at once. That's what I do. And then we discussed it with someone promptly. In the beginning, it was like 10 phone calls a day. <laughs> Hello, I'm being nasty, and I know I'm being nasty. I am being selfish and self-centered. I am, I'm, I'm in fear. I don't know what to do. And I follow directions, you know. Um, pause when agitated. That's a good one, right? <laughs> and I get to practice it today. Pause when agitated, right? I don't react like I used to. You know, I used to react. Step 11. You know, who knew that there was a way to live, you know, 24 hours. We were, we were to live in these 24 hours, you know. And even today, I'm guilty of living in next week or being stuck in the past. And then what happens is my mind starts chattering, you know. And I start getting uncomfortable, you know. Or I start practicing behaviors that are non-God principles. And what I love about my God is, you know, he, he's with me all the time. But when I start practicing non-God principles... I could feel that. I was talking to someone before. I could feel myself shrink. And then the mind starts going. Ding, ding. And then I know it's me, right? So we think our troubles are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is the extreme example of self, will, Ron, riot. Although I usually don't think so. I must be rid of the selfishness. I must or it will kill us, right? And I can't do this without God's help. So that's step 11. is very important. To this day, I wake up in the morning. I hit my knees. I'm doing some codependency no more stuff now. But I also read my reflections. I always do my third and seventh step prayer. And I usually do them on my knee with my dogs. And then I go downstairs. I get a cup of coffee and I sit quiet. Usually for about 10 or 20 minutes. You know, when I review my day. And sometimes I make a list. But then I become a human doing again, you know. So I try to keep a list. But there are things, you know. There are things that I need to accomplish. And then at night I review my, my, my day, you know. But when I was going through that first year, it was hard. But I was beginning to hear my mind. My mind was starting to quiet down. My soul was starting to quiet down. My daddy got sicker. You know, my grandma got sick. You know, I was, I was evil. And this is, this is the grace of God. I was able with my brothers and sisters to hold my father's hand and watch, watch him take his last breath. And it's probably one of the most painful things I have ever been through. But I am still here. And I am sober. And that is nothing short of a miracle. And that's because of... The program of recovery, the fellowship, the meetings, my sponsor, what, what, God, <laughs> you know, God. God wants me around, you know. It says in our 12 step, nothing will ensure immunity against drinking as much as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when everything else fails. Now, I'll wrap myself out. In the first two years of my sobriety, I lost so many family members. I lost four family members that I couldn't even walk straight. And maybe had I sponsored someone immediately, maybe I would have gotten through things quicker, but I didn't. But by the end of the second year, I started to work with others. And I think that for me, that's when I closed the circle. 
That's when I was able to do God's work. Sit there with another alcoholic, and I love it. I think, come on, girlies. I go into the meetings looking for you people, by the way. You know, I look for the people with a one day, one day back especially. Hi, a one day back. I'm like, lock on target. I'm locking on different targets these days, you know, because I know that this program works. You know, and it's my responsibility. It was one of those promises I made to God. I'm like, you know what? If the stuff in this book, in this book really, really works, I will help as many women as I can. Men and women. Until it's time for me to join you. Until it's time for me to leave. You know, and I look back over the last ten and a half years and I got like five minutes. I made a lot of mistakes, but I did a lot of good too, you know, and if, you know, and if I did good, it's only testimony that I aligned my will, my thinking, my actions with God's actions. Not because I am the great I am. I am not. I am a humble servant, you know, and I have an incredible life. Um, but the highlight of my life really has to be being there with my family. I got married in sobriety, you know, boy meets girl on the A campus. <laughs> You know, too soon, too fast, who knows? You know, we're no longer married, but we're amicable, which is just amazing. And I have a lot of work to do in that area, you know? And um, I found that I don't even know how to date, <laughs> you know? How's that? I actually went out and got books because I don't know how to date, you know? <laughs> I just know that. Uh, <laughs> This year has been really tough for me, but I'm here, you know, and one of the biggest things is when I get in self, I help another person. I'm there for other people. I ask for help. I ask for help. I get on my knees and say, please, God, help me. And then I put the action. I found out this is a spiritual program of action. Who knew? You know what I'm saying? What a different way to live. I'm so grateful for the people who brought this message to me. I'm so grateful to the God of my understanding that I was actually willing to do this. You know, it says it in the big book, alcohol beats us into a state of reasonableness. Untreated alcoholism also does that. You know, page 52. I try to live, you know, if I got those things, I, I'm doing another inventory with my sponsor because it's important. I'm finding out there's new levels, there's new roots to be ripped out. I don't ever want to be that girl that walked into these rooms ten and a half years ago so broken and so lost and so hopeless. And I found out that I don't need to be. I found you people. I found God. You know, I have a program of recovery. I have people that love me and people that I love. So in closing, I just want to let anyone know if you need help, I'm here. Um, if you don't think this can be done, you're wrong. <laughs> I want to thank Ron for asking me to speak. You know, um, trust God, clean house, help others. Amen. Thank you one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have, we have, I think it's Kerry C. next week, is it? Kerry C. is coming in next week. Uh, if you're in town, you're at Meg Barnes deal to get here. <laughs> Our speakers come a long way at their own expense and time, and it's customary to form a line and thank them because they do give up themselves. They need to know that. Uh, how important their message is, and sometimes just to, to take it a second out of their day, because there's probably what four hours of traveling time you're staying overnight to cost of a hotel. There's a lot of expensive time. It's a, there's a lot of service that goes into AA, and a lot of times it's, it's more in, in what you see in their feet than the message that they're carrying. But, but Dawn carries a powerful message. Anyway, we got a nice way of closing. Uh, if you guys are uh, our sister group, it's a big book study on Thursday, 7:30 at Salem UCC Church, 186 East Court Street. Come over and see us. We, we read that big book. We uh, align ourselves with it. Thank you. And we have a nice way of closing.